And today is 3 7 17. So in a commensal relationship, and I like the way Hank sums it up, one party benefits, the other's like, meh. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't do any harm to them. But we don't know that they're getting any benefit. Um, vultures and lions are an example. So lions eat their prey. They leave the carcass. They can't pick the bones totally clean. And then when the lions clear out, vultures will come and actually pick the rest of the carcass clean. There's a benefit for the vultures. They'll follow lions around. Doesn't do the lions any harm. They've eaten their share. The other one that Hank mentioned in the video, do you remember what commensal relationship he mentioned? A lot of people got this one wrong in the viewing guide. Barnacles. So do you know what a barnacle is? We're going to look up a picture. So those barnacles adhere to a surface, and that surface might be a rock, it might be a boat, um, it might be a whale, it might be a, a clam, and, and they're glued there. They're really hard to get off. I mean, you can scrape barnacles off something but um, they use a biological adhesive that has almost no equal. And within what looks like a rock, which is actually their shell, so that top part here where it looks like a little bit of a beak opens up, and they can basically stick their neck out. And I believe they're filter feeders. So they, they filter water that's coming past them for little tiny things that are living in it, and that's how they make a living. That's their niche. So what... Um, Hank was saying about barnacles and whales is barnacles are known to attach to whales. And what we don't know is if there's any effect on the whales. So we know that the barnacles benefit for sure. Um, they, they get a trip through the ocean. Basically, they are not able to move. If they attach to something that does move, they get to pass a lot more water than they normally would, and then they get a lot more food than they normally would. So it's a real benefit for them. It's like your dog driving down the road, sticking their head out the car window. That's essentially what the barnacles are doing. What we don't know is if there's any benefit to the whale. We don't think there is. Um, and Hank mentioned, you know, does it make the whales less sort of water dynamic? Does it make them less aerodynamic? Does it slow them down? If so, they're harmed, and then what kind of relationship would it be? Parasit Parasit yeah, it'd be a parasitic relationship. Um, Maybe the barnacles actually provide some camouflage for the whales, and the whales are harder for, most whale species don't have a lot of predators, but they're harder for some predator to see. In that case, what would it be? Mutualistic, Mutualistic because both, both parties would be benefiting. As far as we know, this is commensal. Now, here's the interesting part. There are a lot of things that we now know are mutualistic relationships that we once thought were commensal because it's very often hard to prove that there's a benefit. Um, some of the bacterial relationships that we used to look at and think, eh, it's probably commensal. We now know that there are benefits to the other organism. So a lot of, there, there aren't a whole lot of well-documented commensal relationships. There are mostly relationships where we say, yeah, as far as we know, it's commensal. But we're not sure. Okay. What I would like you to do now is go ahead and take that quiz. Now we're going to start to talk a little bit about measuring things about communities. So there are two things that we measure about communities, species richness and species diversity. What does it mean if you're rich? A lot of something, yeah. So you can be rich in money, rich in friends. Right now I would like to be rich in cough drops. Um, it means you have a lot of something. And species richness, as you might guess, means that a community has a lot of different species. What does it mean if something is diverse? What are we talking about when we talk about diversity? It's a word we hear in common everyday language, but you may not be familiar with the biological definition of diversity. What does it mean? Talk about it talk about it at your table and come up with a working group definition. Let's come up with a working definition for species diversity. Hmm. Talk about it at your tables. 
a little bit more detail about these. So when we look at species richness, and this is an important characteristic of communities, and I'll, I'll tell you why. So just flat out, and this is pretty easy because richness means having a lot of something, the more species that a community has, the higher its species richness. And that's true whether you have one individual of each species or whether you have big flourishing populations of lots of species. Now, here's something interesting. If we start out at the poles of the planet, the closer we get to the equator, the higher levels of species richness we tend to see. Why would that be? More sunshine at the equator, which means more plants. What forms the basis of all food chains? Plants, producers. More sunshine means you can have more producers, means you can have more consumers. So there, there's just more energy to go around. Um, if you have a room with, you know, one pound of food versus a room that has hundreds of pounds of food, one of those can support a lot more individuals. So you're going to find more individuals and more species in general the closer you get to the equator. Community species, community species richness tends to e increase as you get closer to the equator, and the further away you get, the less species richness you tend to see. So let's compare two things. This is a rainforest. Now this is actually a temperate rainforest, but it's a rainforest. There's a lot of warmth. There's a lot of water. Um, we, can, we can fake it and say this is much closer to the equator. Let's look at another ecosystem. Does it look to you like there are fewer species in this picture than in the other? It's pretty sparse. There are no trees. Uh, most of the plant forms are very, very tiny. Um, you have insect life. There would be fish in the rivers. You'd have the occasional grizzly bear wandering through and some wolves. Um, but in terms of the overall qu number of species, it's going to be much lower here than it is here. There's just less energy to go around in this environment than there is in the other environment. One of these has got a lot more energy. So the more energy we have in the system overall, the more individuals we can support. Okay, so species diversity, the difference in species diversity versus species, species richness. Species richness is just counting them up. Doesn't matter how many there are. Species diversity is more complicated to calculate. Um, it's some of the, the little math that biologists actually do. I used to joke when I was in college that biologists don't have to do math. That's for physics and chemistry people. But um, this is part of what biologists actually do that's mathematical. And there are these complicated indexes um, of species diversity, which include, you know, how many individuals of each species and how many species, and you get a number. You get an actual number. And here, here are some pictures that illustrate. This is an area in the sort of arid plains probably of Texas, um, a little further north. Actually, that could be the Dakotas even. That could be the Dakotas. <laughs> Um, versus some place that might even be in Central America or perhaps Southern Florida, maybe Africa. I don't know. It's, it's rainforest for sure. It's very, uh, and you can see the mist in the air. You can see tons and tons of species. Now here's the thing. In an environment like this, you lose one species. Is there somebody else to step in and take over that niche? Maybe, maybe not. You know, is there a line of job seekers wanting to do that particular ecological job? There might be, but there might not be. If you look at a community like this, if you lose one species altogether, if a species goes extinct or is extirpated, driven extinct in a particular area, is there another species that may be able to step in and do that job to adopt that niche? Yeah, probably. There's probably a waiting list of species looking for jobs. So a generalist species in a place like this, heck, even a specialist species in a place like this, um, anytime something gets popped out of that community, there's probably another species that can pop in and do the job. That's not the case in ecosystems with lower species diversity. 
basically, the more individuals you have of the more species, the more likely it is that all the functions of your ecosystem are going to keep going. And the same can kind of be said of human communities in a lot of ways. The more people with the more skills and the more perspectives you've got, the better able you are to handle challenges because you've got people who are thinking about things in different ways. And it's the same thing with communities, with biological communities and species diversity. The more species you've got, the more you know, healthy, stable populations of species you've got, the more likely it is that your community can resist um, disaster, basically. Okay, what I want you to do now is pull out your vocab. You can start working on Part C for a few words tomorrow. Very brief recall quiz over species diversity and species richness. That's it.